You will have seen from the, the diagrams that Neil's put up about how the DDEX messages are structured that every single blob had at least one identifier space in it, whether it was ISWC or UPC or ISRC or whatever it happens to be. Um, and one of the things that we, by creating these standards, has been pushed very hard is to encourage users of the standards as much as possible to make sure that there are identifiers in the message. Because if you look at very automated industries like banking, all of that's done by identification. It's not done by lots of metadata, it's simply a whole string of numbers that, that reference other data uh, and that makes the whole process much more automated. Um, and so identification is, is extremely important. So I thought I'd just uh, spend a few minutes sort of describing, you know, a sort of uh, a professor's view of, of what identifiers should do. Um, and although the source of this is Wikipedia, it actually does make some sense. Um, an identifier is a unique expression in a written format, either by a code, by numbers, or by the combination of both to distinguish variations from one to another among a class of items. Some of these words are quite important and I'll, I'll sort of draw those out. Um, in computer science, identifiers are lexical tokens that name entities. The concept is analogous to that of a unique name. Identifiers are used extensively in virtually all information processing systems. Naming entities makes it possible to refer to them, which is essential for any kind of symbolic processing. So amongst all that gobbledygook, um, there are some concepts that I want to just draw out. Um, one is the thing, the reverent, the referent, that is the thing that's actually got to be identified. Um, and obviously any uh, identification system's got to be very clear about how that referent is identified. Also key to any identification system is that it's about a class, a group of things that are alike. And obviously, the two that we'll uh, talk about, uh, or uh, um, Jose and Richard will talk about, are, are classes of their works and their sound recordings. Um, and also, they have to be able to um, identify an instance, in other words, a specific item within a class of, of things, depending on, on whatever that class of, of things is. And in making sure that a, un uh, a system, a unique identification system works, the identifiers have to be unique. You don't want two identifiers for one item, and that clearly one identifier for two items is a complete disaster. Um, you need persistence in the sense that the, the identifier never changes over time, and it sticks with the thing that it's referencing. Obviously, ubiquity is important because identification systems only really work when they're used as widely as humanly possible. And this, this term, functional granularity, which amongst metadata nerds is something, if you say it at a meeting, you have to put $5 in the swear box because it's one of those things that we, get, we all get off on. But what fun functional granularity means is you have to know to what level of entity you are trying to identify. So you've seen in the, um, in the, in the, in the blobs that uh, describe the messages that we have this level of work, the musical work, of the resource, the sound recording, and of the product or the release. Each of those is a different level of, ab of, of abstraction. And it's a question of, in functional granularity, making sure you know which thing you need to identify. And what some people will say, um, a rather circular phrase, that if it needs to be identified, it needs to be identified. Uh, and that's what the sort of functional granularity is about. Another very important aspect of a decent, unique identification system is that it needs a reference descriptive metadata. So it's no good just having the identifier but you've got to have an agreed uh, reference uh, descriptive metadata that applies to every identifier. So I'm sure Jose will point out with ISWC, there is a fixed 
number of fields that have to be uh, completed before an ISWC gets, uh, gets allocated. Without it, the thing doesn't make any sense. And the other thing is creating trust around the system. There has to be a, a set of governance rules which everybody knows about so that they know if we need to change the system, if we need to adapt it, there's a set of processes whereby the community together can actually work together, much like DDEX does, to actually make that change so that there is full buy-in. And over the top of all this, obviously, there has to be um, issues around cost of administration. I'm just going to briefly wrap up on uh, this section about identifiers um, before Niels goes into the remaining DDEX standards. Um, the, the only one I actually wanted to draw to your attention is we've talked about, with ISWC and ISRC, we've talked about identifying entities. Um, what we haven't talked about is identifying um, contributors, people. Um, there are a number of standards um, that do that. The Musical Work Society Network has the uh, Interested Party Identifier, IPI, which identifies composers, publish uh, publishers, writers, lyricists. Um, the um, Musical Work Licensing uh, Companies, the, the, the ReSounds and, have, and PPLs, they have uh, um, an identifier that identifies performers, which is IP, um, IPD, N, IPN, sorry, too many acronyms. Um, and these all work extremely well, but obviously they work within a fairly closed environment. Um, one other ISO standard that has been around now for a few years is called the International Standard name identifier, ISNI, um, and you will see those if you go to a performer or artist or uh, writer, composer um, entry on Wikipedia, you will find at the bottom that there is a line there with it which says ISNI and, is, and there's a number underneath it. It's very common within, um, within Wikipedia and, and in other databases as well. Um, and, and this is sort of one to watch, as it were, because this is something the music industry has looked at for a while now. Um, not everybody's entirely comfortable with the way it works because it came from the library community um, and academic books. And so whilst you know, they're very good at this sort of metadata stuff, it does mean it was kind of created in a way that doesn't neatly fit within the music industry. Um, but hopefully over, over the coming years you will start to see that creep into, into the supply chain as well. I'm not going to go into the detail of it, um, but uh, it, I just thought I'd mention that as, as one to watch out for. Um, and I think the website's isni.org, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so isni.org if you want to look at that in a bit more depth. Because clearly we have to d identify the collaborators, the people who've been involved in the creation and performance of these things. And it's actually one of the things, if you talk to any DSP, that they find most frustrating, that there isn't enough or an easy way of identifying artists and contributors. Um, and it limits opportunities for discovery and search within their systems as a consequence. Um, so look out for that.